Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. You just call on me, brother. I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19 Critical Care, What Providers Need to Know. This is the April 24th update of DKB Mid Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. Thank you for joining us. We are fortunate to be able to add a new weekly program to our educational efforts around COVID-19. We are grateful to have Sue Hansen, a clinical nurse specialist at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle with us today. Sue is coordinating many of Harborview's COVID-19 efforts. DKB Med and our partners will now offer twice weekly 15 minute webcasts and podcasts featuring the latest information on new emerging data and important topics in COVID-19 care. We will also leave time to answer your pressing questions. These programs will be available on Wednesday evening with Dr. Allwater and Friday morning with Sue Hansen. Sign up at covid19.dkbmed.com to be sure you get the latest updates. Just as knowledge of COVID-19 is evolving rapidly, this program will change over time. We welcome your suggestions to make this as beneficial as possible. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AMAPRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CME and CE information. To test for CME and CE credit, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There you will also find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CME and CE programs on a range of topics. Here are our learning objectives. Again, I'm very happy to introduce Sue Hansen, a clinical nurse specialist at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Sue, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to join this program. Um, I think we are two and a half months into COVID-19 now. So if you have not found yourself in critical care by now, I'm sure that uh, you will in the future as uh, COVID-19 has a far reach and it's going to be on everybody's minds shortly. Again, thank you to DKB and Med and Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. This topic is going to be about proning. So what is proning and how does it work? We're going to review why proning, normal physiology, the benefits of proning when we do and do not use it, and alternative therapies, especially related to COVID-19. So one of the big reasons why we prone is because we have shown that it works. One of the biggest well-renowned trials um, that demonstrate this is the PROCEVA trial. This came out probably in 2012. They looked at 466 patients. They divided them into two groups. One was supine, one was prone. The prone group, prone for a minimum of 16 hours. What they found was is that the patients who were in the prone group, they found that they had 28 ventilator-free days were cut by about 4% compared to the supine group of 10%. Successful extubation, they achieved successful extubation in 81% of the population compared to 65%. And their 28-day free mortality was nearly cut in half. The supine group was 32% and the prone group was 16%. In addition to that, they saw some long-term effects. This is the proportion of people over an interval of time, and they found that those in the prone group had a 90-day survival rate, 76% compared to 59%.
Now, one of the reasons why this is significant, this trial was significant, is that they found that the numbers needed to treat, and this is the number of patients you need to treat to prevent one bad outcome, and in this instance, it's mortality. That number was six, and any time the number is on the low side or uh, single-digit side, it is a very strong statistic to show that proning does work. Now, in order to understand how proning works and the benefits of it, you also need to have a little bit of an understanding of normal physiology. I'm not gonna go into all of this, but just know that your lungs are divided up into four zones. And the first zone, the upper portion, does not participate in gas exchange too much, and it has very little blood flow. And we kind of call this kind of like the dead zone or dead space. Zone two, there is more and more perfusion and more and more of this area participates in gas exchange. But zone three is where the most gas exchange and blood flow occur. But zone three are in those deep dependent dorsal regions of the lungs. Now for normal gas exchange to occur, it must uh, go through this alveolar unit. We have thousands and thousands of these alveolar air sacs and they, the majority of them are in that zone three or that dependent area. And under normal circumstances, gas flows freely in between that circle area and outside of that circle area. The same holds true for CO2. But again, these small air sacs, the majority of them are in those, out, uh, in those dependent areas of the lung, particularly zone three. Now, this is another study that came out of Denver many, many years ago, and it showed what actually happens on a CT scan between patients who are in the supine position and patients who are in the prone position. And when it showed that when patients are in the supine position, nearly 42% of the left side of the lung collapses due to the weight of the chest organs and the weight of the abdominal um, pressure of the, of the abdominal cavity. And then on the right side, nearly 13% of the lungs are compressed. But in the prone position, you see that it's basically just between one and 4%. So the amount of compression is drastically reduced when the patient is prone. And think again that what you're compressing is that zone three where those the majority of those alveolar units are and where the majority of gas exchange and blood flow occurs. So how does proning work? Well, as you can see from these, the small little picture here, those small little circles at the bottom of the lungs, those are the alveolar units we're talking about. And that is the dorsal region or the dependent region. When someone is prone, there is more uniform alveolar size and distribution of blood flow. And there's also an anatomic bias for greater blood flow to that dorsal region or that third lung zone region. So when someone is prone, there is better matching of local ventilation and perfusion. There is more uh, equal distribution of alveolar stress and there's enhanced secretion clearance from these alveolar units as well. There's additional benefits for proning as well. You have improved right ventricular function. There is a decrease in right ventricular afterload. There is improved postural drainage. When someone is prone, um, there is a decrease in pleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure, which also helps those alveolar units open up in air rate. Um, in addition, um, there is a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, so it makes it a lot easier for your right side of the heart to pump, pump blood through. This is the Berlin criteria. It's a very broad definition of acute respiratory distress syndrome. But basically the guidance is, is that if your patient has a PO2 between 200 and 300 with a PEEP of greater than or equal to five, these patients benefit from proning. If your patient has a P to F ratio less than 100 or less in between 100 and 200, excuse me, with a PEEP of greater than five, those patients tend to benefit from proning. If your patient has a PDF ratio less than 100 with a PEEP of five, those, those patients too team, tend to benefit from proning. But there's no hard and fast rule of when you should prone. There are many institutional variances of prone, but the general consensus is, is that it's always best to prone early. Um, it's always best to also exhaust all efforts to improve your patient but if you reach that point of where it's two to three days, 48 to 72 hours where your patient has not improved with other efforts, then it's probably beneficial to prone your patient earlier than later. 
Now with the COVID-19 patients, this is a more difficult call because they do not present the same way as a classic ARDS patient. They do not have poor compliance. They actually have preserved compliance, but they have substantially greater amount of atelectasis, that area of zone three where those alveolar units are collapsed. And they tend to be more hypoxemic and, and tend to have more refractory hypoxemia. So with those patients, we see that we are proning them probably at the two day mark. And we don't prone, um, we don't always follow the Berlin criteria. We make it more of a softer call. So at our institution, we have been proning patients sometimes when they're only on 60% and five a peep, or maybe they're on 40% and 15 a peep. Um, we will make that call sooner than later on these patients because they are so refractory. When do we not use proning? Well, this too is institutionally dependent, but most of the literature supports not proning in pregnancy, recent sternotomy, um, patients who have high intracranial pressures, facial or neck trauma, recent tracheostomy, open abdomen. But again, uh, there's no absolutes. In our institution, we, in our protocols, we took out the nomenclature of relative versus absolute, and we prone anybody who is at the point where they may, um, they may expire due to their respiratory failure. So it's a diff difficult call to uh, determine uh, whether or not you're gonna risk the possible further damage from proning a patient who has high intracranial pressures or um, go ahead and let them pass. It's an extremely difficult call, but again, there's no absolutes. Additional adjuncts to rescue therapies, inhaled nitrous, Flolan, steroids, uh, neuromuscular blo blockade for, for vent dyssynchrony, um, ECMO, and we are starting to see more and more awake proning. These are patients in the acute care area. And the principle is the same as to regular proning with someone on the ventilator. It's to recruit those lower air sacs that are in lung zone three. COVID-19 considerations, if you're going to have to prone somebody in a COVID-19 room, there are some things you really need to be mindful of before you go into the room. Um, one of those is specific to what are the goals of care for this patient? Has that been discussed with family? These patients are very, very sick and they can easily code during the proning process. Another thing is how many people are gonna be going into the room? Does your institution have a code blue process? We do. Uh, the goal is to minimize entry into these airborne respirator rooms because you do not want to pose greater risk to staff as well as you may not have all the equipment available. I know we have to be very mindful about who gets PPE and, and who needs to go into the room. Additionally, you need to also think about head positioning. We have proned nearly 30 patients in the last month, and I can honestly say I haven't proned that many patients in a year. So we have to be mindful about the equipment. We have to create alternative head positioning devices and you need to make sure that whatever you're using works before you go into that room. Thank you so much, Sue, for those updates. We will now continue to the listener Q&A. To submit questions for Sue about next week's topic, ventilation management for beginners, please send questions to qa at dkbmed.com. If we are not able to address your question in this session, we will try to address it in another. Sue, our first question is, what complications are you seeing with proning patients? That's a very good question. Pressure ulcer injury, um, particularly around the face and oral pressure ulcer injuries uh, regarding ET tube and ET tube securement. It is extremely important to make sure the patient has prevention dressings on prior to proning, especially around those sensitive skin areas around the mouth, the eyes, the ears, as well as the upper shoulders, the hips and the knees. Um, it's really horrible that when you have a patient that survives this critical illness, only to have to deal with uh, severe pressure ulcer injuries that require debriding or surgery to repair or fix or maybe become infected. So it's really, really important to monitor those areas. Thank you. Our next question, is your institution manually proning or using a mechanical proning device? Our institution is using manually proning. We use several methods. Um, we, we stopped using the mechanical proning device or the, the prone bed 
probably about a year ago, um, seeing uh, so many more complications related to pressure injuries, as we stated before. Also, it was very expensive and it took a great deal of time to get uh, the, the device in house and to prone your patients. And we, our goal is to prone within 60 minutes. So we use several different methods. The one that we use the majority of the time is a turn and positioning system called the tortoise. It comes in two pieces and it's very easy to use. Another method that we use is the bolster method. You make bolsters to help prone your patient and support your patient's chest and the hips. And a third method that I've seen other institutions use and we've used here, is kind of like the burrito method where you use two sheets to wrap the patient up and use those two sheets to turn the patient onto their belly. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we see any more complications with the manual proning versus the mechanical proning, but I have to say that um, uh, the pressure ulcer injuries we are not seeing with the, um, with the manually proning like we used to see with the mechanical device. Thank you. Last question. How are you preventing pressure ulcers? Well, one of the ways we're preventing pressure ulcers is, like I stated before, is making sure that we uh, really do due diligence to pad the patient up well before they prone. You know, our, our protocol calls, calls for the first prone duration to be 18 hours. Um, after that, we really do need to place the patient in supine if they are stable enough to do so. Um, and we need to take those dressings off and we need to see where the injury and the pressure points are. In addition, when they are prone, we need to make sure that we're doing micro turns to uh, alleviate those high pressure point areas. Lastly, um, again, one of our uh, high areas of pressure injury is around the mouth where the breathing tube and the ET tube go. Um, we are starting to use different padding devices to check those areas. We are starting to check the oral area if we can check it every four hours to make sure that we don't see any uh, pressure points beginning to occur. One of the difficult things is that we cannot move that ET tube when they're in a prone position. So we're trying to use other ways to prevent those pressure ulcers from occurring. But the major point is, is that you need to monitor that skin religiously, uh, whether they're prone or supine. Okay, great, thank you so much. As a reminder, to claim CME or CE credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. There you'll find information on the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. Please be on the lookout for our next activity on Wednesday, April 29th, featuring Dr. Paul Allwater from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. We will send out an email when it becomes available. Any questions can be submitted by sending to qa at dkbmed.com. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Sue, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate all of the valuable input you've given us. You're welcome. I'm happy to participate. Thank you again.